Just start by saying welcome back. It's Fertility Factor Fiction again. We are super excited to have you guys all back here. And this week's topic is whether or not platelet-rich plasma can improve your ovarian function and whether or not that's something that um, is going to be uh, helpful for women who have diminished ovarian reserve or low AMH and, uh, and poor responders. So we wanna talk about that topic tonight because it's been up and coming and there are centers all across the world that are doing it. And the question is, does it actually help patients or does it hurt patients? Is it useful, is it useless? Uh, I'm gonna tell you in a minute. So I think we've got enough people on. Um, we'll get started and uh, I appreciate your patience while we work out the technical glitches sometimes. So thanks again, guys. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so what is platelet-rich plasma? Platelet-rich plasma is a fraction of your blood that includes a very strong or, or high concentration of platelets and they believe there are some stem cells in there as well often. And the theory is that this has a stronger regenerative potential for for healing. So it's used in a number of different types of um, medical services. So the orthopedics guys use it. My own son had it several times um, for some hip uh, injury that he had. Um, it's used in hair restoration. They're using it in um, skin treatments and so on to try and improve your body's healing capacity. How does it do this? Well, it is chock full of all sorts of medication, not medication, sorry, but chemicals, cytokines and um, growth factors factors that can really help improve the sort of resourcefulness and the ability of your immune system and your body to kind of regenerate itself. And so that's why it's part of the regenerative medicine field. So as an example, they say in at least this one article, it has been postulated that the heightened regenerative properties of platelet-rich plasma, which we just call PRP for short, may be explained by higher concentrations of growth factors, such as transforming growth factor beta or TGF beta, insulin-like growth factors one and two, vascular endothelial growth factor, which we know has a huge impact in the ovary, epidermal growth factor, basic fibroblast growth factor, and hepatocyte growth factor. So all of these are growth factors which can kind of help improve things help restore the function of tissues and so the question became can we do this in the ovary and will it help regenerate things so I will tell you a little story because this is kind of interesting this is a, an opportunity to take something really kind of cool um, that has definitely shown some benefit in certain fields of medicine and apply it to our field with the hopes that it's really going to make a difference so I had a patient who was definitely in her more advanced reproductive years and she came to me and and said I've heard that we can do this in Greece and I want to do this and I said well you know the problem isn't doing it to regenerate the ovary the problem is the egg quality is still going to be hampered because of the genetics and she was close to 50 so we know that a substantial proportion of the eggs will not be ideal because they will be genetically abnormal at that stage so she insisted that she wanted to do this and when I tried to explain to her that the results would definitely not be favorable and and that the likelihood that this would succeed would be low she insisted that this should be possible so she did go to Greece and this is a very good example for the studies we'll be reviewing tonight and there they actually were able to stimulate her ovaries and produce two blastocysts and she transferred the blastocysts and they did not work so the question isn't whether or not it's going to make you an embryo and this is true of all things in infertility and, and, and in vitro fertilization in particular the real question is is you're going to achieve a live birth. So I want to review some articles with you guys tonight which have come out fairly recently. One's from 2019 in October and then there's a more recent one that was just um, very recent published in uh, um, January, end of January of this year. So the one back in October is called Live Birth Rates in Poor Responders Group After Previous Treatment with Autologous, that means the same patient, platelet-rich plasma and low-dose ovarian stimulation compared with uh, poor responders used only low-dose ovarian stimulation before IVF. 
So in this study, they took a group of patients, did intravaginal injections of PRP through the vagina, just like you're doing an egg retrieval, but instead of sucking out fluid, they injected the ovaries with the PRP and then looked through it to see if the patients would improve their success rates. So the interesting thing here was that when they compared the groups, the ages were roughly the same, the body mass index was actually very thin, um, relatively healthy women, their infertility duration was the same, their partner's age was the same, pretty much everything was the same, including their, their FSH um, prior to starting and their AMH levels prior to starting. Uh, AMH was a little bit higher in the group that did not receive the PRP. So when they looked at the number of eggs that were collected between the two groups, there was no difference. And then when they looked at the duration of stimulation, there was also no difference. So you weren't getting more eggs if you had the PRP injections, and you also weren't getting a shorter stimulation, um, which often is reflective of the quality of the eggs. So then they went and looked at the actual outcomes of the IVF cycle. So if you look at the fertilization rate they did not have a difference in the number of eggs that were fertilized between the two groups. The implantation rate did not differ between the two groups. The clinical pregnancy rate did not differ between the two groups, and neither did the live birth rate. Although, there were substantial differences in the actual numbers. So if you look at their research, it shows that as an example, clinical pregnancy rate in the PRP group was 33. Um, versus only 10, uh, sorry, and these are percents, in the group that did not receive PRP. So that's quite a difference, right? 33 versus 10. But when you do the actual statistics, it shows that there's actually no difference between those two. Same thing with live birth. They had a 40% rate in the PRP group and only a 14% rate in the non-PRP group. But again, that was not statistically significant and it wasn't even close to being statistically significant. So when you do these calculations, we always use something called a p-value. The p-value is the chance that you're finding out the result sort of by, by random luck. And if your p-value is less than 0.05, then it means it really looks like it's a, a statistical truth. If your p-value is over 0.05, but under 0.07, there is what they call a trend. In this study, it was 0.7, so 10 times the level needed for a trend. So somebody else tried this more recently. This was a little bit of a different study. They had um, 46 patients who underwent the PRP treatment, 37 that they compared them to that did not. And in this study, they actually brought the patients back for three months and injected the PRP into their ovary for three successive months because it can take about that long for an egg to be recruited and then ready to grow and develop. So they wanted to give themselves the best chance to get a robust response. So in that study, the very interesting thing was the levels of the hormones that they analyzed. So when they looked at women's AMH levels, your anti-malarian hormone levels, they showed almost a 50% increase in your AMH level after these injections. So this gets everybody excited, right? How do we make AMH go up? There's absolutely no way to make AMH go up. But in this study, when they injected the PRP, your AMH actually goes up. So they went from a mean of 0.62, and that's in um, the nanograms per mil, up to 1.01 nanograms per mil, highly statistically significant. For their FSH, it dropped from 13.6, which is quite elevated down to 9.07 which is more normal anything under 12 makes us a lot less worried and the antral follicle count went from 4 for the pretreatment to 7 for the post treatment group so these are quite significant and all of these were highly statistically significant and they're clinically significant because when we see those differences we say wow that's really impressive so this sort of led me to thinking this was very hopeful but then you go back and you look again at the outcomes, and here it really got interesting. So the biochemical pregnancy rate, so that's just testing positive for your beta HCG level, was statistically significantly higher. It was 12% in the PRP group and only 2% in the control group. So that's a, quite a huge difference. I, I'm sorry, it was a number of 12 and two, which reflected 26% and 5.4%. So quite a significant 
significant difference, a five-fold increase difference, and that was statistically significant. So you are seeing more embryos in plant. And then they looked at the clinical pregnancy rate, which is our ability to see a positive heartbeat. And again, they showed a 23.9% in the PRP group and a 5.4% in the control group. And that was again, highly significant. So again, we're actually now getting to the point where we're not only seeing you get pregnant, we're actually seeing the fetus develop and a heartbeat be present. But when they looked at live birth rate, again, there was no difference in live birth rate. So some of these are going on to miscarry or they are genetically abnormal and being terminated. And so despite the fact that it looks really promising, you're seeing substantial changes in the AMH, you're seeing substantial changes in the clinical pregnancy rate, the chemical pregnancy rate, all of these seem really, really hopeful. At the end of the day, we need there to be an improvement in your live birth rate. If you are a poor responder, we know that even if we make you make more eggs, we can't change the genetics of your eggs. Nothing can do that. And unfortunately, because the genetics can be compromised, you're gonna end up with a higher risk of failure and or miscarriage, no matter how good we are at promoting the development of an embryo. So factor fiction for this week was, does PRP actually help you achieve a live birth Earth, and the answer is no, it is a fiction. As far as we know right now, there is absolutely no evidence that supports the use of PRP for improving live birth outcomes in either IUI or IVF cycles. So with that in mind, I am going to open up two that were sent in to us from before. So I am gonna have our uh, eternal social media guy, uh, uh, Tarek, Tarek Ibrahim here. He's gonna ask me, I almost called him Dr. Tarek Ibrahim. <laughs> so he's gonna ask some questions and I'll answer them and then we'll get to the ones you guys have been posting as well. As always, we need lots of likes, shares, make sure you give, give us lots of thumbs up and subscribe to the YouTube and the Twitter and the Facebook and the Instagram and get your friends too as well. That helps us grow, it helps us reach more people. Um, and this has been really productive and helpful for loads of people. So uh, make sure you, you send out some good vibes. So Tarek, go ahead. First question, uh, how do you treat chronic uterine thickening? Too thick for embryo transfer. Oh, uh, so if you're talking about the endometrial thickness, not the uterine wall, then endometrial thickness can be controlled by giving less estrogen or even going natural. And I guess in a case where it was really difficult, you could actually use a little bit of an anti-estrogen like letrozole or even Clomid, which can actually thin out your lining a little bit and then go from there. If you really needed ultimate control, it can be done by putting you on a GnRH agonist like Lupron, which will shut down your estrogen production, and then you would only get the estrogen that we give you, and so that would actually um, you know, help patients make a, a slightly thinner lining because we could control the dosage of estrogen you're getting. Now, if you're talking about the thickness of the uterine wall, meaning the muscle wall, there is not a lot that you can do for that. Um, there is some shrinkage in the volume of your uterus when you use Lupron or a GnRH agonist, but it's fairly minimal. So you gotta be kind of cautious about that. There's no good way to fix the thickness of the wall. Um, what causes a fibroid, fibroid and should I get it removed? Is it, diagnosed, is it dangerous to have? Uh, okay, so fibroids are caused by a variety of different factors. No one actually 100% for sure knows what causes them, but um, they are not usually dangerous. They can be harmful to pregnancy if they are in the cavity of the uterus. So that's typically referred to as a submucosal fibroid. And if you have one of those, it should be removed because it's a significant increase in miscarriage risk. Otherwise, unless it's pressing on other structures like your bowel, your bladder, your kidneys, and so on, there's really uh, not anything significant that you need to worry about from most fibroids. The most typical symptom that comes from them is heavy bleeding, and obviously that can be significant if it's really driving you crazy. So um, see your gynecologist. There's lots of treatments for fibroids now. Um, most of them are safe and very effective, and there are surgical treatments too. What are the possible effects of having an abnormal PAP and a transfer? A PAP. PAP. Uh, abnormal pap smear prior to transfer. So as long as you don't have high grade disease, there's virtually no compromise. 
Um, if you just have a low-grade pap smear or what's called an ASCIS, which stands for atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance, you really don't need to worry about it at all. Those patients are perfectly fine and they do well, so I wouldn't be concerned about those ones at all. Um, if you have a high-grade pap, you must have it investigated prior to doing your transfer because you may need surgical treatment of the cervix and that can actually have quite a significant impact on your pregnancy. Not to mention underlying a high grade pap smear can be cancer. So it's really important you know what you're dealing with. Is flying safe at the end of the second trimester, particularly with a history of miscarriages? Yeah, it's pretty safe to fly as long as you're not going in a really high flight. So if you're going on a short trip like I do frequently between Toronto and Windsor, it's definitely not a problem. Um, even if you're going on a slightly longer trip like Chicago, New York, Florida, those sorts of things, it's fine. If you're going on a very long trip, there's probably some risk from the air pressure changes. Um, certainly not at the end of the second trimester. It's much more of a risk in your early first trimester where the embryo is more susceptible to those kinds of changes. If you're in your second trimester and are breaking out in acne on chest and back, is there a way to prevent that? Uh, there's probably no way to prevent it. Um, so scrubs, um, you know, are safe. Uh, lots of soap and, and water is obviously a good choice always. Uh, and then there are medications that you can use. Most of the topical agents are safe. Um, proactive things like that are not going to really affect a, a fetus because you're not going to absorb enough for it to be a problem. In the worst case scenarios, there are antibiotics that you can use during pregnancy which are safe. The most typical one that's used outside of pregnancy is tetra tetracycline you cannot use that one while you're pregnant so be careful about that uh, your thoughts dr. victory on the collecting and if it does anything um, I think your screen just Oh, it darkened because of this thing uh, Declectin. Declectin is awesome Declectin is being used for over I think it's close to 60 years now in Canada it just started getting used in the US um, Diclectin is very helpful but it is not a treatment medication like Gravol is or Zofran or any of those other anti-nausea medications this is a medication that is used that you use to prophylax against nausea so if you take it every day regularly it will reduce your nausea but you actually have to use it every day regularly in order to prevent the nausea if you you feel queasy and then you take it it won't do anything for you it's not like taking a, a shot of uh, gravel max ran zofran any of those things uh, last question that we got in advance uh, most IVF takes two rounds to be successful question mark no so IVF success is incredibly dependent on you and your lab so depending on what you as a patient or as a couple are representing in terms of egg quality, sperm quality, age, body mass index, number of eggs that you have, your hormonal profile, your comorbidities, your psychosocial habits, all of that stuff, plus the lab that you are going to, there is a tremendous variation in your success rates. It can be very low and it can be very high. You can find this stuff by going and looking at the SART, S-A-R-T data for the US or Carter, C-A-R-T-R -R data in Canada. In Canada, it's de-identified, so you don't know which clinic you're looking at. But in the US, it's actually identified for which clinic you're looking at. And you can see the enormous range of success rates based on the clinic. So it does vary highly significantly based on you, you as a patient, you guys as a couple as patients and then the clinic that you're going to in the lab and the doctors and the embryologists and so on that's it okay i got oh you've got more from facebook i can i, I have i can see some of the facebook ones right now okay let me go back to the beginning uh any news on ivf in windsor yes so we are expecting our manifolds these are guests connection things so those should be here any minute and then uh, the wonderful gentleman that owns Fertitech is coming to set up our equipment so we are hoping to be able to start doing embryo transfers very shortly IVF shortly after that so it is coming soon huge likes and thumbs up for that one I am so stoked to finally be able to provide you guys with care here in Windsor 
is there vodka in there? <laughs> what? Oh, in my glass? No, this is water. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, I am a Baha'i. I've never had a drop of alcohol in my life. So I can assure you there is no vodka in here. That's too funny, Nat. Thank you for that funny comment. Um, do you have the I am 28 years old one? Uh, yeah. Okay, you want to read that? Sure. Okay. I am 28 years old, have endometriosis and hypothyroidism and tested positive for thyroid antibodies. I recently had excision surgery and my TSH level is under 2.25. Now with the help of Synthroid, Synthroid yeah. I have done two transfers so far, but both ended in miscarriages before seven weeks. What protocol would you recommend for my next FET FET and should I use an autoimmune protocol? Uh, that's a great uh, case. So first of all, I'm really sorry that you had the miscarriages. That's an enormous struggle. So uh, our hearts go out to you. Um, and I, I want to make sure that you know that we're all here for you in any way we can be if you need help during this really difficult time. Uh, as far as the autoimmune protocol, I mean, we got to know what's wrong and why you're having the miscarriages. I'd need to know if there's any genetic history in you or your partner. Did you have a karyotype analysis done to determine if there's anything there? You also really need to pay attention to your thyroid antibodies because when you're on um, thyroid medication, often you'll have the thyroid antibodies and you said you did test positive for them. We know that patients that have elevated levels of thyroid antibodies are at an increased risk. So yes, I would normally say that's a good instance to try some of the immune protocols. Keep in mind, there's very little evidence anywhere that any of those things are beneficial, but we do frequently try them. And I can tell you anecdotally, so this is not good science, this is just me telling you based on my experience, that it does help. So we would use things like prednisone, and we would also use um, intralipids. And then some people, if you're in the US, you can get access to IVIG. We can't do that in Canada but definitely a very reasonable thing for you to consider. And I would support the use of that because I think there's probably good evidence there that the thyroid antibodies will cause a problem for you. So make sure that that's something you consider. Um, the endo part of things can be contributing as well. It sounds like overall you've got a body that's kind of prone to inflammation. So make sure you're getting your endo under control. Excision surgery is great, but they can never get everything. So you remember you need three months of Lupron and Letrozole prior to any embryo transfer to improve the success rates. So those would be the things I'd consider doing. Um, next one, will maca root help improve sperm count and motility? Do you recommend it? If so, for how long? Uh, I don't know about that one, guys. I've never looked up anything on maca root. I think it's come across my readings before. Um, I will have Jen Strong, our naturopath, answer that one and I will post it for you. So maybe if you can uh, shoot a message out to Jen and we'll get her to answer. Jen, if you're watching, um, throw up an answer for that one if you would. Uh, I have seen some data, distant memory, that said that it does improve things. And I think there was a more recent study that actually said it did not. Um, as a general rule, a single item for sperm is not going to be enough to turn the tide. You need a bunch of vitamins, supplements, um, healthy living, and uh, improved sort of lifestyle choices to improve your sperm quality. It won't work with just uh, one little thing. Okay, let me take an Instagram question. Um, oh, did you? Oh, we did some Instagram. Do you want to ask one another one on uh, Facebook? On Facebook, yeah. Sure. Uh, hi, can I take a sup any supplements before my IVF cycle, which is after two months, i.e., prenatal or CoQ10? Can I or should I? Can I? Uh, can you take supplements? Not only can you, you should. So we know very clearly vitamin D is critical. There is just another study published uh, yesterday or today in Fertility and Sterility talking about vitamin D. Um, you should be on a prenatal vitamin that's very good with high doses of folic acid and you should be on um, a fish oil as well. In addition to that, any other supplements you want to take that are reasonably healthy and, and uh, appropriate are great choices. There's nothing wrong with any of those. 
um, but you should be on supplements for sure. So the vitamins are important, the vitamin D is important. You wanna get your vitamin D level very high and you should actually measure it to make sure you know what it is, not just, oh, I'm taking 2,000 or 3,000 or whatever thousand number of units because vitamin D is very poorly absorbed. All of us work way too hard and we're indoors all the time. Here I am at nine o'clock, I haven't left the building all day. And uh, so, uh, you know, you definitely, definitely wanna make sure you're on vitamin D. Um, other supplements like coenzyme Q10 can be really important, but you need more than two months. Um, so yeah, there's loads of supplements that you should be on. For those that have thyroid antibodies, we were talking about just a moment ago, selenium apparently can have some benefits. So supplements are critical. I am a believer in the naturopathic approach to things as well. Um, so yeah, definitely get with either a naturopath or your doctor and find out what supplements are right for you. Every patient is different, so it's not a one shoe fits all. Uh, I'll do one and then you do the one. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm a 38 year old with uh, Hashimoto's that I'm treating with an endocrinologist. I have had three second trimester loss. Is there any precautions I should take? Does this make me high risk? Thank you for everything you do. Uh, well, you're very welcome. And gosh, I am so sorry. Um, second trimester losses are just so, so hard to bear. Uh, they are hard for you for sure and honestly they're even hard for us it is uh completely a, a very very sad um, empathetic moment for us when we have to you know sort of take you through that so um my heart totally totally goes out to you if you've had that many that is just absolutely horrible and horrendous um so i'm amazed by the fact that you're still going at it that's incredible strength uh, I, I would need to know a lot of detail about why you've had that. It would be unusual for Hashimoto's alone to cause that kind of late um, second trimester, second trimester loss. It's typically more first trimester for Hashimoto's unless your thyroid is wildly out of control. So there might be more to the story for you. You should be exploring things like the shape of your uterus, your immune function, um, whether there are other elements to this like chronic endometritis in your uterus, that can often be a problem if it's cervical incompetence. Um, all of those things would really need to be looked at very, very carefully. You should be seeing someone that deals with recurrent pregnancy loss because they will know very well what to do to help you through that. And that's really critical to, to focus on. So um, again, you absolutely have my support and my sympathy. I would be happy to guide you through it. If you want to reach out to me, reach out to me. Um, I will go through your history in detail and do my best to make sure that you have a successful outcome the next time. If you are doing um, IVF, uh, there's always the option of considering a surrogate. If you are just doing this naturally in yourself, you may actually want to consider doing IVF because it may actually ultimately be safer to have someone else carry your embryo than for you to do it. Okay, let me take an Instagram question. I guess we're there now, right? So, um, okay, lots of love you. Thank you, Docs. I love you too. Uh, okay, you rock, Doc. That's cute. Thanks, Kate. Um, what cycle is better medication, FET or natural FET? I think you mean which one is better to do? Is it better to have a medicated or an unmedicated cycle? So with rare exception, there is no difference. There are some studies that have said that medicated cycles result in a better outcome. So we typically use medicated cycle. But again, fertility is never cookie cutter. So by that, I mean that you can't just do one thing for everybody. And so typically you have to look at the individual patient and see what's best for them. Some people's lining doesn't develop well on a medicated cycle, but does on a natural cycle. And conversely, some people need the extra estrogen. So typically the, the sort of majority of the studies sort of favor using a medicated cycle, but it has to be individualized. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. How would we be able to work together? Um, if you're looking at seeing me for fertility, uh, we're more than happy to take care of it. Just contact me by DMing me on Instagram. I will reach out to you. You can reach us via our website or call the office 
519-944-6400 and I will get in touch with you. We can do video conferences. I've been doing it all week. Um, I talk to people all the time from Israel and Italy and Spain and Australia and the UK. So uh, California is easy. Um, in fact, I was on the phone with a California specialist last night. We're going to be doing some work for them. So yeah, by all means, if you need to reach out, reach out. I will be more than happy to help you from LA. I've been there a couple of times. It's a beautiful city. So uh, yeah, reach out and we will totally help you out. Not a problem at all. You have any there? Tark? Yeah, oh well, yeah. Right. Go for it. Uh, after getting a positive pregnancy test, how long do you suggest taking baby aspirin? Oh, uh, okay, so I am a big believer that in them. So if you started on baby aspirin and you got pregnant on baby aspirin, don't stop your baby aspirin. Continue it all the way through. Uh, you may need to talk to your anesthesia department if you want to get an epidural or a spinal at the end uh, and during your delivery. But aside from that, stay on it as close as you can to the very end um, because it has been proven to reduce preterm labor. We had that on our show a little while ago. Um, it reduces inflammation, it probably reduces preeclampsia. So there's a lot of benefits to being on aspirin, so you should be on it. And uh, there's actually a previous episode, so look back at our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you subscribe, throw out tons of likes, and uh, look at that episode. It should be up there. And if it isn't, I will make sure Tarek puts it up there. But I think it's up there already. Uh, what, do, what exactly does PCOS do when trying to conceive. I've had two miscarriages and just saw an REI or an RE. I, don't, I do not have any cysts on my ovaries, but do I have 16 plus follicles on each of my ovaries? I've been started on metformin and letrozole once I start my cycle along with trigger shots. So she had two miscarriages? Is that I've what she said? Yeah. 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 Okay. So again, I'm sorry for the miscarriages. Uh, so polycystic ovarian syndrome is the worst name for the condition they ever could have given it. Women with polycystic ovarian syndrome do not have cysts. You have lots of little tiny eggs. They're very small. And those little tiny eggs on ultrasound look like numerous small little micro cysts. They're not big cysts. So by definition, a cyst is usually more than three centimeters. And these are less than a centimeter. So they're tiny, tiny little eggs. It is not a good name for the condition. Um, does it impact your miscarriage rate? There is some evidence that women with PCO have uh, less egg quality. And some of this is hard to extract from some of the other elements that go with the PCO. So for example, if your BMI is elevated, you have up to a 3.5 fold increased risk of miscarriage. Um, so it may be a BMI factor. It may be the PCO. It may be the homeostasis in your body, your insulin levels, your sugar levels, some of your other habits. So it's really critical that you get control of the PCO. It is important that you get control of the body mass index. Um, we recommend sort of a three-pronged approach for our PCO patients to succeed. So one is getting you on medications that will help you. Often that's metformin and letrozole. Number two is supplements. So inositol or myo-inositol, d inositol and NAC and acetylcysteine have been shown to have some benefits for patients with PCO. And then there's lifestyle changes. And lifestyle changes, I don't like talking about diets because dieting is kind of useless. And I don't like talking about just exercise. So what we're gonna tell you about is we need you to eat healthy, which for PCO means six meals a day. So you need breakfast and then a snack and then lunch and then a snack and then dinner and then a small snack. Your overall calorie intake, less than 1500 calories per day. And we need you to build muscle. So you should be going either to the gym or I frequently tell my own patients to use Focus T25. I don't own any stock in it or beachbody.com or anything, but I have done the routine myself. It worked wonders. It would probably got me in the best shape of my life and it only takes 25 minutes and the only piece of equipment you need is a hard floor and a good pair of running shoes. So Focus T25 is 25 minutes of unholy terror exercise where you are going hard and strong and you will build muscle and because you're building muscle you will 
use up more of the calories that you take in so you're burning more of them and it helps restore the appropriate physiology to patients with PCO. Now that only works for the women who have normal PCO. If you are in thin PCO group it's actually the opposite. You frequently have to gain a bit of weight rather than lose it but I don't want to ignore that group because they're important too. So hopefully that'll help you and talk to your RE, see what they want to do for you. Don't just go on medication. Just going on medication is not the appropriate approach. You need a, a global holistic approach to fixing it. So Dr. Strong actually got back to us. Oh, she did. Okay. Answer on maca root. I love you, Jen. So she says <laughs> it's, uh, it's great for improving libido. Okay. Good for improving libido. It's an aphrodisiac. It's apparently an aphrodisiac. <laughs> that happens you're going to run into a problem with your um, your lining becoming unfavorable and it can probably even lead to more of a birth control effect than a uh, effect on um, you know beneficial effect so make sure that your progesterone level is not too high it should be fairly stable going into the cycle um, and if you're not using a natural cycle, it's a medicated cycle, you shouldn't be making extra progesterone because you would not have released an egg. Now later into the cycle, it might go up because your, your, your pregnancy can start producing progesterone, but not in the early phase. Uh, what's coming from Facebook? Uh, does PCOS decrease your chances of quality eggs when doing IVF? Yeah, it does, unfortunately. So we do see a higher miscarriage rate and we do see embryo quality um, hampered compared to patients that don't have PCO. So there are management techniques to reduce that complication. Like I said, the lifestyle choices, the healthy um, sort of approach to the, the uh, muscle building and the healthy eating habits, and then loads of supplements and medications. 
Um, there's also some data that you can do something called ovarian drilling, which does require surgery, and that can reduce some of the complications from PCO as well. I am not a fan of doing that. I think it's kind of dinosaur um, endocrinology or reproductive endocrinology. There are better ways to do it now. Um, it's still okay in very, very limited circumstances, but uh, I don't recommend you do it on a regular basis. Okay, let me take one. Uh, how does having a shorter cycle, 23 days, and short luteal phase affect FET? Do you need 10 to 14 day luteal phase to have a successful implantation? Uh, okay, so your shorter phase is not gonna be a huge issue if you're doing a natural cycle, and it's zero of an issue if you're doing a stimulated cycle. However, uh, if you're doing a completely natural cycle, you're not taking progesterone, then that's actually a problem because there are loads of studies that show that that is not a good idea. So your luteal phase is going to have progesterone support, in which case the shorter luteal phase should not be a complication because you're taking extra progesterone. But if you're not taking extra progesterone, it will be a problem for sure, and you need that progesterone support. If you're doing a stimulated cycle, the length of your cycle is being overridden by us, so it's irrelevant. Um, should you take prenatal vitamins postpartum? Um, yeah, you should if you're breastfeeding. If you're not, you probably should for about three months just to get everything back to normal. And um, I'll throw in a, a plug for those of you who are breastfeeding believers. There is no reason not to breastfeed. Um, there are extremely, extremely rare cases where you can't. That's a different story. But as long as you can breastfeed, you should because it is extremely healthy for you. Um, numerous types of cancer are reduced when you breastfeed. You lose 500 calories a day for those of you that um, you know, have gained more weight than you desire during your pregnancy. And it is super, super healthy for baby. So uh, if you want to protect your breasts, make sure you're breastfeeding. Um, everybody should be doing that. Yeah, fire away. Uh, if you're trying one your own, if you're trying one your own, would progesterone mm. injections help or would I create enough during a natural cycle? I know during an IVF cycle, I would need to take it. Would taking it in a natural cycle be equally beneficial? Yeah, definitely not the shots. Um, for some people, we still want progesterone support if their progesterone level is not really high or the egg quality is weaker. Um, or if you have a history of recurrent loss, most of us still believe progesterone helps. So uh, in those situations, it can help even when you're doing it natural, but don't do the shots. Just take vaginal um, progesterone, prometrium or crinone or endometrin. Um, I'm kind of a big crinone fan, but if you can't have coverage for it, it can be a bit more pricey. So one of the other two products is fine. Yeah. That's it? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me take some more Instagram. Uh, I read an article that 12 weeks of vitamin E increased lining by one millimeter. Yeah, so vitamin E and vitamin D have actually both um, demonstrated evidence that they can thicken your lining, so we use that. Um, Viagra can do it as well. They have to be vaginal suppositories. Uh, and then there are some other tricks that can be used also. The PRP that I talked about at the start of this uh, fertility factor fiction um, has also been used in the uterus. And again, there's no evidence that it improves uh, live birth rates. I spoke to a guy in Vancouver about a year ago who had started trying it. He said he did see some thickening of the lining but they weren't sure yet if it was a statistically significant change in, uh, again, live birth rates. So uh, there are a variety of techniques that we use. Sometimes we switch the method that we're giving you the estrogen. If you've tried pills, you may wanna try uh, vaginal instead of oral. If you've tried both of those, you may wanna try patches, um, sometimes a stimulated cycle, sometimes a uh, non-stimulated cycle. There's all sorts of different ways to achieve a thickened lining. So vitamin E is definitely a very reasonable approach. It's super healthy. It's got no detrimental side effects. So um, if that's something you need to increase your lining thickness, it's a very reasonable thing to consider. For sure, I would definitely say go for it. What is endometrial scratching and it, it, is it a procedure you would recommend to assist in plantation? Okay, so you guys probably remember a few, oh, it was probably a month and a half ago, we actually did endometrial scratching as the fertility factor fiction topic. And at that point they had released a study that said it does not improve 
your success rates. And then literally about 10 days later after I did that whole presentation, they actually released two more studies that said it does. So the jury is out right now on whether endometrial scratching works or not. I can tell you anecdotally based on my own experience, we have had patients where we tried other stuff, it didn't work and then we scratched their uterus and it did. And basically what it is, is taking a very small, um, it's called a pipel. So it's about a one and a half to two millimeter tube. It goes in through your cervix up into the uterus. And when it's in the uterus, we are going back and forth and turning it a little bit. And it has a little head and you've created some vacuum suction in there and it'll suck in some of the endometrium. The theory behind it is, that by disrupting the endometrium, you create an immune cascade or an immune reaction, which makes the endometrium stickier. And by making it stickier, you increase the chances of success. So uh, I'm kind of still a believer, but it's hard to believe or not believe right now because it's so confusing from the research end of things. So I'm not sure if it works or not, um, but it's, probably not harmful. There's certainly never been a study which showed that it had less success rate. Um, and it may be helpful. I'm not, I'm not completely sure. Um, Tarek, somehow I screened this out of us. What did I do? Oh, I got it. Sorry there. Okay. Um, whoops. We're flipping back and forth to the rest of the clinic. <laughs> okay. Um, can you briefly touch on IUD insertion. I am having my first uh, one put in next week and I'm not sure what to expect after it is inserted. Uh, an IUD is a T-shaped device we use to help people not get pregnant. And so uh, it's really simple. I do all of mine with ultrasound guidance so I know where it's going. It's very gentle. It's easy with the ultrasound guidance because I'm not poking and prodding you in places you don't want to be poked and prodded. Um, expect mild, mild cramping and some spotting if you're using one of the levonorgestrel containing IUDs like Mirena or Kylina. The spotting can go on for quite some time, but uh, many women, their period will go away after a little while and then they're not getting any more periods. So hopefully that will, um, will help you out. Uh, do you have the one above that? Because I don't. Uh, that's just the one about... Uh, oh, that was Jennifer answer. Strong. Yeah, the next one I've got here too. How low would one's AMH levels be for you all to consider IVF in a patient who is 30 years old with two previous first trimester losses and also has PCOS? How low would one's AMH levels be? I'm not sure what you mean by that. So um, that's a confusing question. If you have low AMH, you don't have PCOS. They actually don't go together at all. So women with PCO have high AMH you shouldn't have PCO and a low AMH. So um, if your AMH is very low, we can still help you. Uh, sometimes we use IVF, sometimes we don't. We just have a real honest talk with you about it so you understand the dynamics and what to expect. If you have PCO and you have a high AMH, we are fine with that because you just make lots of eggs and we, we deal with it. So um, that's perfectly fine, but we don't have thresholds or cutoffs for AMH. Um, we will help anybody based on their AMH level. It's just a matter of what you want after you've heard the information that you need to hear. Um, what are the average costs for surrogates? Uh, so if you're using a commercial agency like uh, Canadian Fertility Consultants, who we are um, you know, very uh, fond of, um, I would have you ask them. We're actually gonna bring them on the show, so maybe I'll save that one for a little bit later. It can be a substantial investment, um, but hopefully uh, Sarah or Leah, if you guys are watching this show tonight from CFC, I'm gonna drag one of you guys on here and we can have you uh, talk to our patients about surrogacy one time. So yeah, I mean, the cost can be substantial, anywhere from sort of $50,000, $60,000 and upwards. Um, it depends on what's involved and where it is and who it is and, and you know how many babies are in there. So it can be substantial for sure. Uh, cervical incompetence <clears throat> that should be filled with your anger toward the term geriatric pregnancy. 
Oh, that should be filed with your anger towards. Oh, okay. Um, wow, I've never thought of it that way before. Okay, so uh, if you haven't read our previous post, I hate the term geriatric pregnancy. There is no such thing as geriatric pregnancy. Um, cervical incompetence is referring to women who have a cervix that is weak uh, and um, it cannot maintain the pregnancy in it without uh, a stitch or assistance. So yeah, I never thought about the fact that that could be kind of hurtful to hear. Um, uh, I'm open to hearing your ideas about what would be better and you and I need to have a chat. So we will talk about that when I see you. Uh, so yeah, let's chat about that and see what we can do. Do you have one over there? No? Okay. Our Facebook folks are being quiet on questions. Uh, I had a gastric bypass and my doctor advised that women in general should take prenatal vitamins as opposed to standard multivitamins because they're more complete. Is this correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. So, uh, fiction. <laughs> um, so, no, I mean, it, it depends on what's going on and what you're trying to achieve. What is important for you to know with your gastric bypass is that you don't absorb um, any nutrients the same way as someone that has not had gastric bypass. And your vitamin intake frequently has to be much higher and sometimes use alternative routes of administration in order to get the appropriate amount of absorption. So um, if you're breastfeeding, if you're pregnant, you need a prenatal. And there's certainly no harm to taking a prenatal after pregnancy. It's got plenty of everything, but it doesn't mean that a daily vitamin like a Centrum or something like that is insufficient. Um, they have plenty of what you need and, and that should be fine in a non-pregnant state. How would you know someone needs to follow an autoimmune protocol? Oh, <clears throat> okay, so I appreciate you asking that question. That is a fabulous question. So there is a whole field of um, reproductive endocrinology called uh, reproductive immunology. And there are doctors out there who absolutely believe heart and soul that it is the main barrier to success. That if your immune system is overactive, it can compete or interfere or even be hostile to your ability to implant an embryo. So the problem with this is it is extremely difficult to test for and it is extraordinarily expensive to test for. So in Canada, we have to send all of the stuff to this place called the Allen Beers Lab. And the Allen Beers Lab is I think in Miami if I'm not mistaken. And they charge like two and a half, three thousand bucks US, which is like five million dollars Canadian <laughs> in order to, <laughs> um, in order to uh, do the testing. So if we've ruled out every other possibility, then actually you kind of have to guess whether or not it's an immune problem. I don't recommend the testing because to be quite honest with you, it's actually cheaper to treat you than it is to test you. So for us doing intralipids, we charge 200 bucks per try um, and you need it like five to 10 days before an embryo transfer at your embryo transfer and then uh, at the two week mark and then every six weeks. So you're literally gonna spend less doing the treatment than you would doing the testing. So why not just get treated is my approach to it. The other treatments that we use are things like aspirin, heparin, uh, steroids. Again, most of those are really uh, affordable or you'll have insurance for. And so I strongly recommend you get the treatment rather than get the testing. For those of you that just absolutely need to know, I completely respect that. I would wanna know if I could know. Um, and it was affordable. So for those of you that want the testing, we'll do the testing. Here's the problem with the testing. They do about 20 different tests, sometimes more. It requires 26 vials of your blood and an endometrial biopsy. And in doing that, it is inevitable that they're gonna show up with something positive. It's literally a statistical positivity. Like you can't avoid it because in any statistical test, we know that one out of every 20 will show up positive, even though it actually isn't. So you're gonna show up with false positives, and then what the heck are we doing? Do we treat it, do we not treat it? You know, is it real, is it not real? And some people are making decisions to choose a surrogate or a gestational carrier based on that immune testing. 
So my advice is try with yourself, use the immune protocol if other things have failed or you're having miscarriages or recurrent implantation failure. And if you have enough embryos to afford to do it once or twice in yourself with the immune meds, yeah, for sure, go for it. If you do not have enough embryos to do it, then yeah, I mean, it's it's worth considering using a gestational carrier or a surrogate because that can help you a lot more than being on the immune protocols. Okay, uh, I think we are down to the last little bit. Um, I used birth control pills for five years and I stopped because I want to get pregnant, but it's not happening. Do I need to take any meds? Should I see a doctor or what? Uh, yeah, let's end up with that one. So um, if your periods are regular and you're less than 35, you should be trying for a year before you look for help. Now, that's the recommendation. Obviously, it's pretty frustrating trying for a year. So if you want to see us sooner, we're happy to see you sooner. But the recommendations and the guidelines are if you have regular periods, meaning less than 35 days, more than 21 days, you should try for one year regular intercourse every two days throughout the entire month. If you're not pregnant after a year, come and see us. If your periods, uh, sorry, if you are over the age of 35, but less than 40, you should take six months of trying. And if you are over the age of 40, you should see us within three months of trying. If your periods are irregular, meaning they are shorter than every 21 days or longer than every 35, then you need to see us regardless of your age because A, that's risky, and B, uh, you will not conceive because you likely are not ovulating on a regular basis, so it will be much, much more difficult. Um, okay, I think I got time for one more, and this is a good one. Uh, what can you expect from me during our first appointment? So what you can expect is a warm greeting, the support of all the staff, a detailed history and physical, um, and the physical is not invasive, and um, a thorough discussion of your testing, the protocols and stuff that we use for testing, and psychological support. So we offer all of that during our initial consult and then an expectation of what you'll do when you come back to see us, how I go through all the information with you, what the potential options will be, and certainly if there are risk factors that you have, we address those during the first meeting as well. Okay guys, we are winding up to nine o'clock. I am starving because I have not had dinner and I wish you all a very, very good night. I hope you guys enjoyed Fertility Factor Fiction this week. Like, share, lots of comments. I need to hear your feedback so we can make the show better for you. We will have some really cool people coming on in the upcoming months, and I will definitely reach out to CFC and ask them to uh, join us for a show in the near future. Um, when they are nearby or in town, we will get them on and we will have them uh, answer your questions about surrogacy. I uh, love you guys. Have a great night. Um, it was a great show, and uh, thanks for watching. Take care.